Hey, everybody, it's Ken McElroy here, and I'm here with my friend, George Gammon. Hey, George. Hey, Ken. What's up, buddy? It's good to see you. Hey, guys. So, like, like uh, you guys aren't following George. You're crazy. Uh, you need to take a look at his uh, YouTube channel. He's got like 250,000 people on it, and he's a master at inflation and Bitcoin and the, some of the real estate markets. And Welcome. Everything, everything macro. macro. Yeah, everything macro. I know. I'm really excited to have you on because I like I get so many questions about inflation, deflation. I know the other night at dinner I was like, you know, why, you know, why is Japan have any inflation? And you like boom, 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 boom. And so uh I can't well, you know, it's super confusing to be honest with you, because I'm a real estate guy and I know a lot of people on my channel are real estate folks, and and you know, we see it in the news like. Is it deflation? Is it inflation? What's happening in the money supply? Is the gold going up? It's like, I uh, mean, it's it's uh, it's very hard to keep together. Yeah, it is. And when you get into the global monetary system, it gets extremely complex and very esoteric, and they have their own language. And just trying to decipher the language itself is a is definitely a challenge. So I know you're an entrepreneur at heart and uh, obviously, uh, you know, a very, very well read and great student on this stuff. How did you get so good at this, uh, you know, all these monetary fiscal policies and how do you how do you understand it at this level? It's just we're both the same in the same boat, Ken. Robert's the exact same way. It's just we get hyper focused on something and you just obsess about it yeah. uh, with you your whole life. It's been real estate. We just talked about that. With me, it was just making money as an entrepreneur from the time I got out of college to 2012. And that's when I kind of quote unquote retired. I was 38 years old. And um, I knew that I needed to invest my own money and, and do it rather well, get a decent return so I wouldn't have to draw down my savings. I could make uh, enough money to pay my expenses just through the cash flow from my investments. But I, I had to invest it wisely. I couldn't just live out the rest of my life and just blow as much money as I wanted to. So I got involved with uh, macro, just trying to figure it out. And I just like a Rubik's cube, it's just a challenge. And it's like, uh, you know, four or five dimensional chess trying to figure out all these moving parts. And I was in Singapore, I was at the Marina Bay Sands and it was about 15 minutes before a dinner date. And I was, ironically, I was on YouTube and I stumbled across Milton Friedman's Free to Choose series. Yeah. And I didn't know who on earth Milton Friedman was, but that took me right down the rabbit hole. And it just really resonated with me. And he was articulating everything I had in my mind for the last 20 years. And then I moved on to Thomas Sowell and then investors like Jim Rogers and Peter Schiff and Rick Rule. And uh, I, I knew at that moment in time that, OK, I, I, this is what I'm going to dive into next. So I took that same kind of obsessive, compulsive energy that I had as an entrepreneur and really put it towards macroeconomics and learning how to invest. And it's just from the moment I woke up in the morning till the moment I went to bed, whether I was in the shower, whether I was at the gym, when I was at lunch. I was just listening to audio books. I was listening to podcasts, to YouTube videos, just trying to learn as much as I possibly could. And you do that for eight years and believe it or not, you, you're going to learn a thing or two. And <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you what, it's been fun to watch. You're, I mean, I, your guests are incredible. You know, the people that are on your channel are just, I mean, I'm just devouring that information. So thank you for putting out such great stuff. I, one of the things that I, I get a lot of questions about inflation, deflation. And so what I wanted to talk today is how, how does inflation fool investors? You know, right now we have real estate going like this. We have Bitcoin going like this. We have stocks going like this. And, you know, and you talk a lot about asset bubbles. So, so, you know, so with all the talk about inflation, yet some economic or, you know, some economists are, are they're they're saying deflation. Which one do you see? Well, first, inflation, deflation is extremely nuanced. So you have to say what is inflating or what, or what is going up in price, what is going down in price. And the biggest mistake that investors make when it comes to inflation is they just look at asset prices in nominal terms. So if their house goes up by, let's say they have a $100,000 house 
and the value of the house or the comps goes up to 110,000. Well, that's the nominal value of the house. And, and most people would look at that and say, oh, fantastic. I'm $10,000 richer than I was last year. But that isn't necessarily true. If the rate of inflation, the cost of goods and services that you can buy when you sell that house goes up by 20%, then you actually lost purchasing power in real terms. So, so the house can go down in real terms while it's actually going up in nominal terms. And we saw that throughout the 1970s as an example, uh, where we had consumer price inflation, prices really going up, the price of housing going up. But if you look at a chart from call it 1971, maybe to 79. Uh, if you look at a nominal chart, yeah, housing went up. But if you look at it in real terms, it's pretty much flat, kind of go up, down, up, down a little bit. So you've got to always adjust for inflation. Then going back to the nuance that I was talking about, most people think that if we have inflation, just everything goes up in price. Or if we have deflation, everything goes down in price. But that isn't true at all. Uh, again, if we go back to the 1970s, the early 1970s, from 72 to 74, while we were having extreme consumer price inflation, meaning the cost of goods and services was going up, the stock market fell by 50% from 72 to 74. So that would be an example of asset deflation while consumer prices were going up in terms of inflation. And then to add it, uh, another layer of complexity, you have to look at what the dollar is doing compared to other fiat currencies. So we can be in um, an environment, let's say the last, um, call it since 2010 or 2011. Back then on the DXY, which is a, a measurement of the dollar against a basket of other fiat currencies, most uh, most heavily the uh, the euro, it was around 70s. So that would imply that the dollar is rather weak. Well, just recently we dropped down a little bit, but before that we were up at 100. So the dollar has appreciated in value significantly from 2011 to let's call it 2020. While at the same time, we all know that prices in the United States for food, for health insurance, for education, for rents, housing, it's all gone up. And we also know that the value of assets, the stock market has gone up. Gold has gone up. Bitcoin has gone up. So all these things have experienced inflation while the dollar has actually gotten stronger, which would imply deflation. So there's a lot of moving parts and you've got to, to start by understanding uh, when you're asking the question, are we going to have inflation or deflation? You start by asking in what? Right, right. Yeah, that's a heck of a point. So, OK, so here's what I'm confused about. So ever, like we're in this pandemic, there's businesses are getting hammered. And we're basically closed. Uh, you know, people are, are unemployed, a lot of them. Uh, some businesses are booming, but a lot are closing. And so why are the stocks and Bitcoin? I mean, I, we already talked about real estate, but why are they like going like this right now during the middle of all this while everybody's at home? Well, you make a common mistake there, Ken. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's just a great point. We have grown up with this belief, rightfully so, that the stock market is a reflection of the economy because the economy is basically the health of the businesses and the stock market is listings of or equities of the business. So it assume if the economy is doing well, the businesses are doing well, therefore the stock market's doing well. And then we see it in reverse order. If the stock market is doing well, we think the businesses are doing well, therefore the economy is doing well, right? But what happened, and I this would be maybe, oh, I don't know, I'd say probably 2000, it'd probably go back to the early 90s if you really wanted to get technical. Uh, the Fed started to come in and manipulate things, and we had more of a financialization of the actual economy itself. And so the economy became more and more uh, reliant upon asset prices 
So the Federal Reserve had to create more liquidity or try to do that. Now, there's an argument as to whether or not they can do it directly or they can only do it indirectly. But the bottom line is it would create more liquidity or more money going into the stock market. So even if the businesses in the stock market are going bust, as long as there's more money flowing into the stock market, (laughs) perversely enough, the prices of those stocks will continue to go up. And then you combine this with something we just talked about on my show, which was uh, supply and demand of housing. But here we have an interesting supply demand dynamic in the actual stocks themselves. So I'm sure a lot of your listeners over the past few years have been hearing about corporate buybacks. All these corporations, they're taking out, uh, they're borrowing money or they're taking all of their profits and they're not investing it back into the business, creating jobs, creating manufacturing, you know, build, uh, investing in um, plants and, and more goods and services. They're just buying their own shares back. Well, what does that do? That reduces the amount of shares outstanding that are available to buy. And then if the Fed comes in and does quantitative easing, one, two, three, four, infinity, (laughs) and their balance sheet goes through the roof, well, now the capacity of the commercial banks, their their balance sheet capacity, in other words, their ability to create more and more loans, uh, that, that increases. And they see the real economy as... Well, I don't really want to touch that with a 10 foot pole from a risk reward standpoint. It doesn't make a lot of sense to lend someone a billion dollars to start a factory, let's say, in California, where we know the business environment is very unfriendly. Taxes are most likely going up. This whole weird GFC thing, we still haven't really figured that one out. We're still a little leery. So risk reward, that doesn't make sense where we could use that balance sheet capacity to maybe lend money to a hedge fund or a financial institution, and they can go and and into the stock market, drive stock prices higher. And we know we have less downside because there's a Fed put. The Fed has their backs, so to speak, because the Fed or in now, whether this is real or just psychological, it doesn't really matter if people still act on it. Uh, They believe that the Fed won't let the stock market go down Therefore, these banks see that as better risk reward, that meaning lending to hedge funds that are going to go in and buy stocks, bonds, create derivatives. The bottom line is is financialize the economy even more than it was before. So my whole point is there's a huge disconnect between the stock market and the real economy to the point where I would argue there's even an inverse relationship. So the worse the economy does, the better the stock market does, because the Fed will come in, increase the size of their balance sheet, create you know trillions of dollars worth of bank reserves, expand the balance sheet capacity, and that means more potentially, or most likely, more capital flowing into the stock market, even though unemployment goes to 15%, 20%, 30%. It's just the more unemployment we have, the more quote unquote money printing we get. And if we get, if the stock market goes up due to money printing, then by definition, the worse the economy gets, the higher the stock market goes. Yeah. Boy, and we're not even out of this. Like uh, we're looking at a whole new, I, I, right now, I think the the Fed's balance sheet is like 7 trillion or something. And yeah, seven uh, I think trillion. it's, yeah. And, and then there's some projections that it could be over 10 when this is all said and done. Oh, I uh, think. I think it, it could be over 10 in 2021, yeah. uh, not, not before this is done. And, and to give some people uh, some context, Ken, uh, just by looking at the deficits, because the, the deficit spending of the government right now is being monetized by the Fed. And that just means that the government is issuing debt, let's say, for a stimulus package. And the, they're basically in a roundabout way, selling it directly to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is creating more bank reserves, and that's what the government is using to back up the checks they're sending to, um, you know, into the real economy, to the average Joe or the business for PPP or whatever it is, you know, however they're getting that stimulus out there in the past and in the future. So so they're, they're monetizing the debt, 
that is debt that has to be a part of deficit spending, or they wouldn't need to, you know, if they're just generating that money through taxes, then they wouldn't need to issue the bonds. So my point there is this year alone, the, the deficit or the increase in debt is about $5 trillion, the government, the federal government debt. So why is that a big deal? From 1776 to 1996, the government accumulates, that's 220 years of the, the initial existence of our country. <laughs> the government accumulated $5 trillion in debt. We've accumulated $5 trillion in debt just this year. We're up to almost 28 trillion, you know, 27, 28 trillion total in debt. So that that is totally unsustainable. And now, but what's interesting is where's the line? You know, that we're up to let's say 130% of debt to GDP. Japan is at 230% debt to GDP. I mean, the Bank of Japan owns almost 60% of the government debt. I mean, it's 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 financial engineering on a level that most people can't even comprehend. So, you know, how long can they kick the can down the road? I don't know. Here's the big problem. So if you're if you're one of those people that say, well, we'll just let the Fed handle it. And man, if they've been able to work their magic since 1990 or since, you know, the dot-com bust, well, why can't they do it for another 20 years? Maybe we'll just kick back and invest in our 401k and just let uh, the Fed keep interest rates low and maybe negative interest rates and just let the debt go to 30 trillion. Let, let the deficits go to 10 trillion. I mean, who cares? Let's just do MMT. Let's do UBI. Let's just give people money to stay home. The problem with that is that volatility is never destroyed. It only moves. It only transitions. So what we're effectively doing is we're eliminating volatility from the stock market and from asset prices, because now our economy is completely dependent upon those asset prices. And if you don't believe me, just think about what would happen to the US economy if the stock market went down by 50%, housing went down by 50% and stayed there for the next 10 years. Right. I mean, that would be a 19, that would be worse than a 1930s type depression. So you've got this economy that's completely built on uh, on these asset prices going up and up and up. So here's the problem, is that volatility goes from where it should be in the stock market or in housing prices and moves over to what? Social unrest. Because the delta between the haves and the have-nots gets more and more extreme because the people that uh, don't own asset prices or don't own assets now, it gets harder and harder for them to buy assets because they're going up in price. You see? And as those baby boomers start to sell some of those assets to pay for their, their living expenses, right? You just, you just get this wedge that goes up and up and up to where the millennials and the next generation, they just can't afford to buy a house. They can't afford to buy stocks. They can't afford to put money into their 401k. That's when you see people rioting. That's when you see all this social unrest that we've seen throughout 2020. And it's only going to get worse. So you, you only have two choices there. Either you let the stock market crash or you let asset prices crash or you exacerbate the, the rioting and the looting and everything else. So there is no free lunch. That's the bottom line. Okay. So George, so with all this inflation happening, cause you know, I, I love the, the fed just relaxed their target, you know, from the 2% to now like two ish, I guess. And so, uh, you know, how do investors get fooled or, and what, what can they do to protect their investments? You know, if, if you were like, like when you got done selling your company and you kind of cashed out and you retired and you were sitting there going, um, you know, I don't want to lose what I have and I want to, I want to make it grow. There's a lot of folks right now kind of thinking that same thing. What are some things that they should be looking at? What, what could they be doing? Well, you have to look at what the highest probable or the, the highest, the outcome with the highest probability. What, what is that? And if we, if you're someone who believes the government is going to continue to deficit spend 
and they're going to continue to try to prop up asset prices. They're going to create more and more stimulus. Then that's a, a headwind for the dollar rel relative to, con to uh, hard assets, okay, or relative to consumer goods. So that's just a fancy way of saying we're most likely going to get consumer price inflation. Now, it might not be 1970s, it might not be hyperinflation, but it, it's even the CPI, which I think is understates inflation. Either you're seeing that potentially, or I think the, the my base case is that goes up to maybe 4%, 5%, something like that. So I think what most people can do if they own a home or maybe even a rental property is right now, mortgages are cheap. They are historically cheap. And if you can lock in a 30-year mortgage at, let's say, a 3% interest rate and inflation runs at 5%, then the difference, that 2%, is going to be a transfer of wealth from the bank to you. And so I think that's the easiest thing the average Joe can do if they expect inflation to pan out over the next couple of decades. And to be clear, I, I, I don't think that we're going to get, you know, the next six months or the next year, will we get inflation or get deflation? Again, I think it goes back to in what, uh, in, in asset prices and consumer goods, I, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty confident, although there's no certainties, there are only probabilities, I'm pretty confident that over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, that we're going to average higher consumer price inflation than the 1% or the 2% or even the 3% that you're paying on that mortgage or the, in the 1% or 2% that the government has told us has been inflation for, let's say, the last 10 years. So I think that's a, a good bet. And I think everyone should own maybe 5 10% of their portfolio having gold uh, and physical gold. I think that's a, a, a great hedge. Uh, oddly enough, in deflation, it might hedge as well. Because and if asset prices are coming down, let's say, by 50%, because, so that, because they're so inflated with leverage, Although gold might come down as well, it might only come down by 20%. And therefore, your purchasing power in gold, if you want to buy those assets, actually increases. So right. that, that's interesting. And then for 10% of my portfolio, I like to do what I call a 10-80-10. So 10% would just be physical gold. That's an insurance policy. 80% mm -hmm. of the portfolio, I like to have in investments. I define that as things that pay me to own them. So uh, an apartment building, <laughs> that would be a great investment because that is paying me to own it from day one. And then for the other 10%, I like to have it in speculations. It doesn't necessarily have to pay me to own it, but I see a lot of asymmetry. So a lot more upside than downside. And right now in, in my world, that's uranium, that's uh, gold miners, that could be Bitcoin. I think silver would fall into that category. A lot of the commodities have been beaten up, although they have gone up in price uh, since March uh, quite significantly. I think a lot of them are still pretty cheap, you know, quote unquote. And so that's how I like to kind of set up my portfolio. It's pretty easy, straightforward. And I think if most people kind of just work with that outline, uh, as long as they've got that uh, 30 year fixed rate mortgage, I think over the long run, they're going to have an edge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. Um, you know, I know Peter Schiff would say you're probably a little low on that 10% gold though. <laughs> oh, he might not. I don't know. I don't know. I'm buddies with, with, with Peter and uh, he is obviously a, a gold bug. That's for sure. <laughs> He'd admit that. But he, he's not one of these uh, people, at least from what I've heard, uh, that says, you know, 100% gold. Or oh, You're right. Yep. He likes to keep, from what I've heard, he likes to keep it around 10, maybe uh, 20%. Because that's just, whether you're a gold bug or a Bitcoin bug or whatever, that's just smart investing. You want to be diversified. I mean, just in our last conversation, you were talking about having properties in Houston, all over Texas and Phoenix and Oklahoma and all of these different markets. Why? Because you don't want all your eggs in one basket. If you had every single one of your properties in Houston and the price of oil goes down, well, 
what do you, you know, now, now you're screwed. And, and you could say, well, I, I can say with a, a 90% probability that oil prices aren't going coming down. Okay. But at the end of the day, you know, we as human beings just don't, our, our minds cannot process enough information to, to really have an accurate read on the probabilities of, of anything. And I'll be the first person to admit that. And I think the pros, especially the, the ones with a lot of experience, would admit the exact same thing. I mean, even Stan Druckenmiller, one of the most successful investors of all time, admits that he only gets it right about 55% of the time. So if Stan's only getting it right 55% of the time, in my opinion, that means we as amateurs should be uh, diversified. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs>